Hello everyone, welcome back. I am Dr. Alexandra Mayer. If you are new to my channel, welcome. We're super excited that you're here. Um, if you've been watching our channel all along, we appreciate it. In today's video, we have a big topic. Um, we're gonna be talking about PMS. Most women know what PMS is, right? Um, but what we're gonna be talking about is different kinds of PMS. We're gonna be diving into maybe some dietary and lifestyle considerations, um, and maybe kind of the pictures of PMS, which might help you guys dive in a little bit more on what hormonally could be going on. Um, so before we dive into that, right, if you like our videos, go ahead and hit the like button. Um, it really helps us to get our content out there to more women like you. And um, that's really our goal, is to help more women. So um, go ahead and hit that like button for us. So PMS, right, what's the definition? So it's premenstrual syndrome, and it is um, basically cyclical symptoms that you get before your period, um, usually physical in nature, um, that are better with flow. So basically what this means is that it's usually like one or two weeks before your period, it's fairly consistent, and the minute that your period actually starts, things improve, right? Um, by physical symptoms, we're usually looking at things like bloating, breast tenderness, we can look at a little bit of irritability, um, food cravings, a little bit of anxiety, right? Um, those physical symptoms that we notice and we don't like, right? Constipation, diarrhea, all that kind of thing, but um, aren't severe enough to majorly disrupt our lives. So what do I mean by this, right? There's actually a difference between PMS and PMDD, which is a premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Basically, premenstrual dysphoric disorder are severe symptoms, um, usually a bit more um, psychological in nature that disrupt our lives completely. Um, Premenstrual dysphoric disorder can be very, very, very um, difficult in patients and basically makes it virtually impossible for you to like go about your life during those periods. Both cyclical in nature and can have similar etiologies, but very different outcomes. So um, there's PMS and there's PMDD. So let's kind of talk about what, what do we think about when we think about PMS, like hormonally um, labs we should maybe consider. When we're thinking about labs, there can be an increase in estrogen in the mid or late luteal phase. There can be a decrease in progesterone, specifically day 21. So you'll remember way back when we did a video on progesterone and how to properly run that, right? Um, what to think about with progesterone, so you can see that video, we'll link it here. Um, there can be increases in prolactin. So when we think about changes in the cycle, um, prolactin is really high on our differential algorithm of things that we want to check. Um, so prolactin actually inhibits progesterone and so um, can lead us to have symptoms of PMS. Um, the next thing that we want to think about is hypothyroidism. So um, hypothyroidism on our algorithm of things that affect the period, right? Hypothyroidism is our first step. So when we go down kind of looking at that, that's something that we really want to think about. Um, with hypothyroidism, you can have major changes in, in flow. You can have major changes in um, symptoms related to PMS before your period, bloating, cramping, um, weight gain, anything like that. So that's really something that you want to get assessed and assess well. Um, and then the other things that we could run is like prostaglandins, right? Like prostaglandin E2. We know that in a large number of PMS um, kind of categories, right? There is that increase in general inflammation. Um, so prostaglandins can be something that we may want to consider as well. So let's dive into our PMS categories. So who knew there's different categories of PMS, right? Uh, I feel like as women, we just kind of, if you have symptoms right before your period, you have PMS, that's it. Um, so they're actually different categories. Um, the first one is PMS A, and that A stands for anxiety. Um, these patients tend to have a lot of nervous irritability, they tend to be very high in anxiety, and they also tend to have mood swings and insomnia. The next category for PMS is PMS-C. So PMS-C stands for cravings. Um, these patients tend to have a lot more food cravings, uh, both for sugar and food in general. Now, we do have an increase in the amount of calories that we naturally consume um, around that time, but um, these these patients will really experience those heavy cravings and particularly usually heavy sugar cravings. These patients also tend towards heart palpitations, um, increase in fatigue or decrease in energy, right? And then headaches. PMSD is for depression. Um, and it's exactly what it sounds like, right? These patients usually are very weepy. Um, they tend to be forgetful. They do have a little bit of insomnia. Finally, the last category we're gonna talk about is something called PMSH, which is hyperhydration, right? So these patients are bloating, 
weight gain, fluid retention, and breast tenderness, all in the PMSH category. So when we think about uh, each of these categories, let's go through kind of the hormonal considerations for each of these categories. So the first one is PMSA, which was anxiety, which PMSA, we see an increase in estrogen and a general decrease in progesterone. This makes sense. Progesterone is responsible for our ability to make allopregnenolone, and allopregnenolone um, will bind to GABA receptors and help to kind of calm us down. It actually is the reason why um, SSRIs or things like antidepressants, right, are given to treat patients with certain kinds of PMS because SSRIs will actually increase serotonin, right, or nice happy hormone, but they will also increase allopregnenolone and can bind to GABA receptors and help to calm us down. PMSD, it's actually the opposite of PMSA. So we tend to see a decrease in um, estrogen and an increase in progesterone in these cases. With PMSC, we tend to see a, a, a general increase in inflammation. So we're seeing an increase in prostaglandins and a decrease in magnesium. And then with PMSH, we tend to see an increase in, in sodium retention, which makes sense, and an increase in aldosterone. So we're thinking about kind of some of the general causes of PMS, and we're actually going to get into each of those categories and maybe some things to consider with each of those categories, categories depending on your picture. Um, when we think about this, right, we want to get our labs run at a certain time. So earlier on in the video, I talked about um, getting labs run. Other things we want to consider would be things like estrogen secretion, so just in general, secreting too much estrogen, um, estrogen detox through the liver. So we talked about this in our previous videos on estrogen detox. We did a phase one, phase two, and phase three estrogen videos. I think those would be really helpful. So we're gonna link those in the show notes because if you're experiencing kind of the picture of excess estrogen, um, sometimes it is literally a metabolism issue. Um, and then we wanna think about things like exogenous estrogens, right? So um, plastic water bottles um, and some of the toxicants that bind to our estrogen receptors and kind of make themselves weakly act like estrogens in the body. Those can really make a huge difference in our um, hormone production. Now, before we get into kind of the specifics of each kind of PMS, um, there's a few general things that we wanna go over for, um, that have been shown to be helpful for PMS. So first of all, there's some really good research on um, fiber intake and decreasing PMS symptoms. This really makes a lot of sense. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because we know that estrogen um, decreases if we have enough fiber in our diet because we're able to actually bind up our estrogen and get them out of the GI tract. So again, those videos on estrogen detox that we did in the past would be really, really helpful. When we're thinking about dietary recommendations and PMS, there was an interesting study done on uh, looking at vegetarian women versus omnivorous women. And they found that vegetarian women um, excreted about two to three times more estrogen in their stool, meaning that we're able to like get it out of the body the way we want to, right? Um, and had about 30% reduction in free estrogen levels in the bloodstream. Now, my patients know that uh, I am big on protein intake for women. I think that's really important and getting in enough calories is really important if we want to maintain our metabolism. The key component to this is that increasing vegetable intake and increasing fiber intake is really, really important if you want to decrease estrogen dominant symptoms and help with um, PMS symptoms. There was another study that showed that women who um, decreased their fat intake from 40 to 25% of their overall calories, right, and increased their fiber intake from 12 to 40 grams of fiber a day, um, saw a significant reduction in PMS symptoms. And interestingly enough, actually, uh, high fat diets are correlated with increases in PMS symptoms. Now, there might be some other things in, at play with this, right? With high fat diets, people do tend to be eating a lot of cheese and a lot of dairy, which does tend to increase prostaglandins and can be very pro-inflammatory. So maybe an inflammatory issue, um, but we are also finding that as we decrease down the fat in, in women's diets and increase up healthy um, fibrous vegetables and things like that, that PMS symptoms improve. The next thing I want to talk about is soy. So soy is a little bit of a controversial topic, right? Um, interestingly enough, the research on, sh on soy shows great benefits in terms of PMS symptoms. The research on soy actually shows us that it helps to promote the good pathway of estrogen detox um, and can actually decrease, or sorry, increase, pardon me, sex hormone binding globulin. Um, this can have impacts on your testosterone. So we do have a previous video on sex hormone binding globulin and a previous video on testosterone that can be helpful because this can definitely impact that. By increasing sex hormone binding globulin though, we're taking a little bit of that estrogen out of circulation, putting it into storage because we know that it weakly binds to estrogen um, and will allow us to kind of decrease some of those symptoms. So 
that can be really, really helpful. Um, now you might be thinking, oh my God, really? Like she's recommending soy? Um, soy is one of those kind of very important things that we think about, right? So with, with soy, you really want to do organic and you really want to do non-GMO. Um, the quality of soy really matters, but in terms of the research on PMS symptoms, it actually does help. So when we think about kind of milligrams of soy isoflavones, half a cup of edamame has uh, about 150 milligrams of soy isoflavones, and then um, a, a small amount of soy milk has about 25 milligrams of isoflavones. So um, you do, would really need to increase your soy intake um, and really make sure that it is non-GMO and organic, um, but the research on that's actually really good. The next kind of lifestyle component that we want to think about when we think about um, PMS reduction is exercise. So with exercise, um, we know that exercise, well, first of all, increase endorphins and decreases things like depression and anxiety. So in patients who are having anxiety, having some of that um, PMSA or PMSD, it can be really helpful for that. Exercise also does help us to, in general, decrease those cravings. Um, and with exercise, we find that pretty much across the board, PMS symptoms will get better if patients are exercising on a frequent, regular basis. Now, that is really important. Frequency is actually way more important than intensity. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go out and do really intense things around our period. Um, that's actually really not a great idea. When we're thinking about training for the cycle around your period, you want to give your body a little bit more grace and a little bit more um, time to recover and things like that. Our hormones are different around that time. But regular movement really does help with PMS symptoms and there are multiple studies that show that. So finally, we are gonna dive into the different categories. So with that PMSA or kind of that anxiety picture, we tend to see a decrease in magnesium and calcium. Um, so when we think about treating this picture, we wanna look at things like B6, we wanna look at things like vitamin E, and then we wanna look at zinc, um, but we also wanna look at increasing magnesium rich foods. So nut, nuts and seeds are a really good option for that. With PMSC or that kind of cravings picture, right? We wanna be doing things like a hypoglycemic diet and help to keep our blood sugar really stable. So stabilizing fat and protein at meals can be really helpful to reduce those cravings. And then we want to, in general, decrease that inflammatory picture a lot. So um, things like evening primrose oil, fish oil. So um, a good solid source of omega-3 is one of the most anti-inflammatory things we can do in the body. Um, and then a little bit of magnesium can be really helpful in this picture. With PMSD or that depression picture, we really want to think about um, decreasing sugar and salt intake, increasing things like fish intake, um, and then things like 5-HTP. So in previous videos, I've mentioned this, I'm gonna mention it again. If you are on an SSRI or any sort of antidepressant, 5-HTP is definitely not a good treatment strategy. But 5-HTP can be really, really helpful for helping to balance that mood, along with things like B6 and zinc. You're gonna see B6 a lot in these videos. Um, B6 is a really great nutrient we're thinking about both estrogen detox and progesterone um, creation, and so it's a really important nutrient. Finally, PMSH, so that hyperhydration. Um, with this, we wanna do things like decrease alcohol, we want to decrease coffee and tea intake, we want to decrease salt intake, and then we want to stay away from things like sugar, um, coffee, and, and tea, like I mentioned. Um, and then when we think about PMSH, right, really what we want to do is get things kind of moving through the body. So things like a dandelion tea um, can be really, really helpful for that. So um, those are kind of the types of PMS and some of the pictures that we're looking at both hormonally and then nutritionally to get going back on track. When it comes down to it, the most important thing when we're running labs is running them on the right time, right? So if you're a 28-day cycle, you need to be running progesterone on day 21. If you're having progesterone run outside of that um, and you have a normal cycle, it is going to be inaccurate and ineffective. Um, making sure that we're checking things like prolactin, right? And thinking about that inflammatory picture is gonna be really important. Um, conventionally, when we think about PM, PMS, our most common conventional treatments are uh, SSRIs, so antidepressants, which we talked about can be really, really effective um, because they are binding to that GABA receptor and helping um, to increase that allopregnenolone. Um, and then things like oral contraceptives, right, which some patients definitely don't want to be on. And so um, if you think about what PMS picture you are, just some minor changes in diet, like increasing magnesium can go a really, really long way. Um, let me know what questions you have in the video and we'll see you next week for next week's video.